Okay, good morning to everybody again. <laughs> when I heard that we were very short of time this morning and that I have just half an hour for my presentation, I thought of the best way how I could probably do it. Just cutting the talk in half is not that simple because um, it is an unfoldment of a principle which is nourished by all kinds of different sources. <coughs> So I decided to concentrate on information from both Madame Lavatsky and from some scientists which might be new to you and of which you might not have heard before. So I'm going to start with the mystery of the human aura and what it has to do with previous lifehoods. So there was a remarkable American scientist I came across in the 1990s who had done extensive research into consciousness and the human aura, discovering previous lives. Her name was Dr. Valerie Hunt, Professor of Physiological Sciences at the University of Los Angeles, who died in 2014 at the age of 97. <coughs> she was challenged by students in the 1970s to study consciousness, even ancient literature, because they were of strong opinion that the true function of a university was to expand the frontiers of knowledge, designing new directions. <coughs> this became the starting point of a serious investigation into the mind, consciousness, and the human aura, which is today called the bioelectromagnetic energy field. How does this energy field around us come about? What is it made of? and what is its function, and what are its different aspects. <coughs> the first equipment that was used by Professor Valerie Hunt in her laboratory to measure the energies of the human body was a telemetry instrument, especially built for them by a NASA engineer who had already developed a telemetry system for astronauts used to send their vital physio physiological recordings of muscle and heart activities from the moon to the earth during the first manned space trip. The signals are broadcasted by FM radio frequencies from a battery operated radio transmitter and amplifier attached to the person's belt. It was already known that stimulated brain, heart and muscle cells create electrical energy, which can be recorded. But using the telemetry instrument, even the auric field of a person appeared. It is smaller in amplitude, but higher in frequencies, which could later be associated with mind phenomena and human consciousness, as well when, as well when more sophisticated computer software was developed, the biofield monitor. <coughs> this monitor showed that the energy field of each individual is unique changing with emotions and consciousness. It selectively transacts with other outside fields of information, altering raw stimuli to meet its own needs. Every information must pass through this energy field before reaching the nervous system. It is a, it is a quantum concept of vibrations. The frequency can be visualized by different colors, and it has its own integrity. The scientists came to the conclusion that also the mind is an energy field phenomenon, having its seed in the aura. Before brain waves were activated, the field already responded, although the person experienced no conscious sensation. Experiments with test persons in a sound, sterile room showed that people felt strange sensory aberrations and lost all sense of time. Their consciousness altered so rapidly that they were not able to operate instruments. When the electrical aspect of the room was withdrawn, the auric fields became randomly disorganized, scattered and incoherent. Energy was jumping between people and their chakras or energy centers. Their body responded as though they were being threatened. When magnetism was decreased, gross incoordinations occurred where people could not balance their bodies anymore. Other experiments showed that reflexes from material reality, like bodily or personal states, are recorded in and recovered from the brain. 
Other impressions, such as experienced knowing, higher information, transcendental ideas, insight about ultimate sources of reality and creativity in its purest form are properties of the higher mind, outside the domain of material reality, yet interacting with them in an open system, because Professor Valerie Hunt and her team were able to measure them. The mind can explore far beyond the closed circuit of the brain, and the brain may not even be aware of it. Grounded in a state of material reality, the energy field ranges from about 350 to 600 cycles per second. An altered state of consciousness exhibits a range of up to 200,000 cycles per second, containing information of previous lifehoods which can be experienced. Professor Valerian uh, formulated a difference between past life and lifehoods. When reading The Secret Doctrine by Madame Lavatsky, she came across a sevenfold constitution of man for the first time, and that karmic law does not create anything, but that it adjusts everything, and that Madame Blavatsky positioned mystical bodies in the auric field, using the concept of bodies metaphorically. Professor Hunt explained that past lives just emphasize the physical existence of a life in a time-space construct. Life hoods, on the other hand, emphasize the soul, which is part of the mind field, which exists now and has no time reference. It operates as a field. Lifehoods carry information about the soul's experience in a material body at any time in history. Since a soul is never destroyed, only the body which it enlivens, information from lifehoods are always now a part of each new life. The concept of lifehoods gives answers to what the soul experienced, what patterns and beliefs the soul carries into each incarnation which are the memories of the soul's experiences. When awakened, past and present are experienced as now and not an, as an historical event. As a spectrum of human consciousness broadens, lifehood recalls come invariably with it. Professor Valerie Hunt became a mystic herself in later life and helped hundreds of people with her mind mastery meditations to open up experiences from previous lifehoods, from scientist colleagues, the most skeptical of all, to coma patients with amazing success. And she believes that reincarnation is a fourth dimension concept. In the key to theosophy, Madame Blavatsky tells us that during the last quarter of every hundred years, an attempt is made by the masters to help with the spiritual progress of humanity. That towards the close of each century, an outpouring of spirituality does take place. Someone or more persons have or will appear in the world as their agents, and that a greater or less amount of occult knowledge and teachings will be given out. This effect is very noticeable in the scientific community. So what significance does theosophy apply to the human aura? And in what way do the esoteric teachings corroborate Professor Valerie Hunt's findings? It starts with cosmogony. The expansion of the universal matrix, or Mula Pakriti, is the periodical shadow of the immaterial substance present in eternity, says the secret doctrine, thrown into the lap of maya or illusion. It is not an increase in size, but a change of condition. It is spirit and life, says the Mahatma Kutumi, without quality or quantity or form, but rather the space occupied in that ocean of spirit by the results of effects <coughs> impressed thereon. This radiant force field is the underlying essence which contains everything in its potentiality. Every physical phenomena, from subatomic particles to complete and complicated systems, like planets or a human being, is an emanation of this underlying electromagnetic energy field. 
Its radiation around animate and inanimate objects was called throughout recorded human history, aura. This auric envelope of a human being has seven layers, just as cosmic space and our physical epidermis. It is within on different planes of subjectivity, merging gradually into objectivity. When the season of reproduction arrives, the subastral extrudes a miniature of itself from the egg of the surrounding aura. This germ grows and feeds on the aura until it becomes fully developed, when it gradually separates from its parent, carrying with it its own sphere of aura. And this auric egg, or this underlying energy field, is really the true manifested man, says Madame Blavatsky, because it is a manifestation of the vital life forces, which are flowing forth from the various foci of the reincarnating monad. So what is a monad? As we have heard before, a monad cannot be called a spirit per se. Sorry, I missed one slide. So a monad cannot be called a spirit per se. It is a ray or spark of the absolute, having no relation with the conditioned and relative finiteness. It is unconscious on our plane, needs a spiritual model or prototype to shape, its shape itself into, and an intelligent consciousness to guide its evolution. The astral form, or manifested ideation of a human being, is this spiritual prototype closing the monad, says HPV. It happens in and is surrounded by its egg-shaped sphere of aura, and this aura is the true manifested man, she says. The astral form itself is the nucleus of this sphere, an ethereal agglomerate of life atoms in the auric egg, a combination with manas or mind and buddhi, its vehicle of so or soul which gradually assumes more or less a definite human outline. The aura is the origin of the feeling of sympathy and antipathy. Every human being is surrounded by its own emotional and passional, as well as psychovital atmosphere, a portion of the lower layers of the auric egg. Every human passion, every thought and quality is indicated in the aura by corresponding colors and shades of colors. If these nerve vibrations are made intense enough and brought into vibratory relation with the astral element, the result is sound. So when the ray point of the spiritual monad reaches its own intermediate sphere, it descends no further into matter. Only its psychomagnetic ray, having stronger affinities for the material world, descends still further, awakening into activity the life atoms on each one of the planes between that of the re-embodying ego and the astral physical matter of our Earth. Each part of the composite human constitution remains on its own plane, but extrudes its excess of life from its itself into the next lower plane until finally the physical plane is reached, where only the tip of the ray, collecting unto itself life atoms of this plane builds or forms the physical germinal cell. It would be quite, quite wrong to suppose that the re-embodying ego itself is the germinal cell, or on, or on a slightly <coughs> less physical plane than ours. The process is an exact analogy of what occurs in the building of the globes of the planetary chain where the passage of excess of life takes place along and around the range of substances from cosmic plane to cosmic plane. And as we heard before, the vital force is not enclosed in man. It radiates within and around him like a luminous sphere and or aura, and it might be made to act at a distance. It is the aura which, according to our mental and physical state of purity or impurity, either opens for us vistas into other worlds, or shuts us out altogether from anything but the three-dimensional world of matter. This is how important the role of the auric egg is in the human constitution. 
It is the field of all the different ranges of consciousness of the embodied man. And it is likewise the ethereal and astral and even spiritual substance or auric envelope out of which every one of the vehicles of the human entity is formed. Why then is not the recollection of past lives brought over by us from our last birth into the present birth? Because memory is included within the skandhas, which Professor Valerian called the fourth dimension, the Kama Rupa in theosophical terms. And the skandhas having changed with a new existence, a memory, the record of that particular existence, develops. Yet the record or reflection of all the past lives must survive. For when Prince Siddhartha became Buddha, the full sequence of his previous births were seen by him. And anyone who attains to the state of hinana or knowledge can thus retrospectively trace the lines of his lives. This proves to you that while the undying quality of the person, un that the undying qualities of the personality such as love, goodness, charity, etc., attach themselves to the immortal ego, photographing on it, so to speak, a permanent image of the divine aspect of the human man who was. His material skandhas, those which generate the most marked karmic effects, are as evanescent as a flash of lightning and cannot impress a new brain of the new personality. Yet their failing to do so impairs in no way the identity of the reincarnating ego. The memory of every person alive, indeed, is imperishable preserved in the mysterious recordings of each existence. And the immortal individual, individual spiritual entity will one day be able to look back upon it as upon one of the pages in the vast book of lives which will, by that time, it has compiled. So there's another interesting um, investigation by a pair of other scientists. In the 1990s, Stuart Hameroff, professor of anesthesiology at the University of Arizona, teamed up with Sir Roger Penrose, professor of mathematics at Oxford University, trying to solve in a united effort as far as possible the mystery of consciousness, how it comes about and what its transmitters are. We all know what it is like to be conscious and have awareness, but what is this conscious mind? How can the subjective nature of our phenomenal experiences, or our inner life, be explained in scientific terms, they ask themselves. Together, de they developed a theory which is called orchestrated objective reduction. The physical medium for consciousness to occur in the brain seem to be microtubules, the largest filaments within the cell structure of the brain neurons. Penrose and Hameroff propose that aspects of quantum theory, like the phenomenon of wave function self-collapse, are essential for consciousness to occur. The particular characteristics of microtubules suitable for such quantum effects include the crystal-like lattice structure. There are hollow tubes around which their subunits called tubulins or globular proteins are symmetrically arranged. That they cooperative interact, having the same frequency as ultrasound. They can be assembled and disassembled as required by the cell. Not only can they connect with the brain as a kind of quantum computer, but also to the universe itself. Monitoring the brain waves of dying persons by using an EEG or an electroencephalogram showed amazing results. About 80 to 100 megahertz is our usual scale of consciousness. 40 to 60 when under anesthetics. <coughs> Lower frequencies are a sign of brain damage. When the heartbeat of a dying person stops, the brain waves drop to zero. But then something extraordinary happens. Suddenly an absolute burst of activity up to 90 megahertz appears in the neurons of the brain again for 90 seconds to 20 minutes. Even with persons who are brain dead and with animals. One could say that death, death seems to be the most awake moment 
which the scientist interpreted as the soul leaving the body. When the person experiences all the stages of his or her life like in a film, as reported from near-death experiences, this led to the argument for an eternal soul. Since a soul is an individualized unit of the very fabric of the universe itself, it acts as a quantum container of stored information of a person's life experiences and can exist outside the body, or with other words, survive it in a kind of entangled quantum soul with all the necessary ingredients and accumulated experiences and latent, pos latent possibilities for further evolution. And since it is able to attach itself after an out-of-body experience to the existing body once more, why should it not be able to attach itself again to a new body in form of a reincarnation in an evolutionary process of optimizing its conscious awareness for its spiritual uh, uh, destiny? That is what the scientists found out and what is their conclusion. So as we know, the secret doctrine or the divine wisdom tradition confirms the universality of the law of periodicity, of flux and reflux, <coughs> ebb and flow with physical signs as observed and recorded in all departments of nature, and alternations such as day and life, night, life and death, sleeping and waking is a fact so common, so perfectly universal and without exception, that it is easy to comprehend it as one of the absolute fundamental laws of the universe, including the evolution of, of, of us humans. When I did my research some decades ago into the forgotten early teachings of Christianity, a culture in which most of us grew up, I discovered simultaneously that Jesus and the Brotherhood of the Essenes, from whose center he emerged, were not only strict vegetarians, but taught reincarnation as well. Uh, we have to skip a few things. The whole text is in the book, but uh, we have to make it short. Bernard Zimmermann was the son of a Swiss watchmaker. He studied pedagogy and became very inspired by great world reformers like Mahatma Gandhi as well as by Eastern philosophies, including the writings of Madame Blavatsky. He finally lectured at universities and governments worldwide on subjects like biological agriculture, equality, anti-atom bomb, free economy, and in 1945, he was awarded an honorary PhD from the University of Toronto. And in 1953, an honorary professorship from the University of Tokyo. His book, To Free Shores, my translation, a record of his world travels, which he sent to me with his signature shortly before his death, is still one of my treasures. So in this uh, book, which he published, Helia and Evangelium, um, or Gospel of the Perfect Life, he refers to two ancient uh, original Aramaic texts. One was, one was discovered in the secret archives of the Vatican, and another one um, in a monastery in the Himalayan mountains. And um, the, what is it called, philosophy, love of Jesus Christ. And uh, the other one was um, translated um, by an Irish priest. And it has very interesting references to reincarnation. Here by Reverend G. Owsley, he translated the other one. So uh, Osley said that this uh, gospel was preserved uh, by one of the Essenes um, mm -hmm. in one of the Tibetan monasteries and was translated for the first time. It was hidden there by one of the Essene Brotherhood to protect it from corruption. Very interesting narratives about reincarnation can be found in these old scriptures. One day it was said when Jesus was approaching a village, he stumbled upon a very hungry stray kitten. He took it into his arms and carried it into the village, where he gave it food and drink and left it with a widow named Lorenza, who promised to care for it from now on. People were very surprised about his behavior, and they said that this man even cared for the, cared for the animals as if they were his brothers and sisters. And Jesus told them that the animals are our brothers and sisters in the great economy of life, sharing the same breath with us, 
and whosoever takes care of the smallest and gives them what they need does it to him. Speaking of course from his higher self or logoic Christ consciousness, who allows them to suffer shall reap the same consequences, because as we have done in this life, so it will be done to us in the next life. When Jesus was asked what he could teach about life, he answered, blessed are the ones who went through many experiences because they will become accomplished through suffering. They will be like the angels in the heavens. They will never die or be born again because death and birth have lost their stronghold over them. All creatures emerge from the invisible and they will return to the invisible until they are cleansed. The body which you put into a grave or which is consumed by flames is not the body that will be because the ones who come will receive other bodies, although their own, and what they have sown in this life, they shall reap in another life. So I will close with a short extract from the book of Golden Precepts, again by uh, Dr. Puruka, where he says, do not kill your personality, do not annihilate your personality in the sense of wiping it out, you have brought it into being yourself. It is part of you, the emotional and psychical part of you, the evolutionary work of aeons upon aeons in the past. Raise the personality, cleanse it, train it, make it shapely and symmetrical to your will and to your thought. Discipline it, make it the temple of a living God so that it shall become a fit vehicle a clean and pure channel for passing into the human consciousness, the ray of glory streaming forth from the spiritual or divine consciousness. It is not the fall of the personal which frees the spiritual man. It is the raising of the personal into becoming spiritual, which is the work of evolution. <coughs> this is the same thing that natural evolution in its slow age-long process is trying to accomplish. Raise the lower up to the higher. Be the holiest and noblest and poorest that you can think of. That you can forget the personality, which, is the, which the body expresses. And by personality, I mean all the lower faculties of you, the lower mental and emotional part of you, your whims and your little this and that. Salvage your lower portions to nobler, superior ones. When the personal shall have become transfigured, when the personal shall be able to manifest more or less fully the sublime inflow from the God within you, your own inner spiritual divine splendor, then you will walk the earth like a human God and act like a God. For each one is a representation on earth of his own inner God. And you represent on the physical sphere as much of the divine essence streaming through your being as your evolution permits you to manifest. Therefore, begin even now to express the God within. You can, and the reward that comes from this is unspeakable and grand and beautiful. Turn your gaze inward, <coughs> not outward. This does not mean to be solely introspective and to abandon extraspection. That is not the idea. You must see in both directions, but do not seek for truth in any place except in the faculty which cognizes truth, your innermost self, for it alone can cognize truth. Peace be with you. <laughs>